your voice. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we will continue in our chronological study of the Gospels. Last week, if you were here with us, you'll know that we were in John 10. Then we went back to Ezekiel chapter 34, spent some time there as well. We looked at Jesus as the one who, if you'll remember Ezekiel 34, God saying, listen, those who have been supposed to be my shepherds, those who were supposed to be shepherding my sheep, they've left the sheep out there wandering, helpless, vulnerable, open to attack, and I am going to send one shepherd who will appropriately shepherd my people, and that one shepherd is the good shepherd, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So last week we looked at that and the promise of the good shepherd to replace all of those other shepherds and really take care of the flock was one that the Jews understood Jesus was identifying with. They understood that they were, well first of all if you look back to chapter 9 and how they were opposing what Jesus was doing, the religious leaders were the most against the Messiah, Jesus Christ. As opposed to the shepherds who only cared for themselves, Jesus said, I am going to lay down my life for the sheep. You want to talk about sacrifice, that is the ultimate sacrifice. We sometimes hear about those who pay the ultimate price in, in giving their lives for our freedom. Uh, here in the United States, those who serve and those who are killed in the line of duty, we talk about that as being the ultimate sacrifice. Soldiers sign up knowing that that's a possibility. Jesus signed up. Jesus undertook this mission, not just knowing it was a possibility, but knowing that was the mission. He was going to lay down his life for the sheep. As opposed to the shepherds who left the sheep wandering and helpless, he would provide protection. He said, you can go in and you can go out and you will have safety. He says, I provide eternal life to all who come to me. It was a very real problem, these supposed shepherds who were not appropriately shepherding the flock back then and it's a very real problem still today there are under shepherds which is what is oftentimes referred to as a pastor there are under shepherds he's the shepherd and then pastors and elders get the privilege of being under shepherds and having care of a local assembly some of the sheep that are his are under the care of pastors all across not only this county or this state or this country, but all around the world. But there have unfortunately been those who have been entrusted with caring for his flock who still leave the sheep unprotected. There are multiple ways to leave the sheep unprotected. Take any amount of time and don't preach God's word and you leave the sheep unprotected. Water down God's word. You leave the sheep unprotected. Fail to appropriately confront in the right times and challenge and encourage and you're leaving the sheep unprotected. Leaving them wandering and helpless. And that's exactly what God was so frustrated with all the way back in the Old Testament. And it was the same when, he con when Jesus confronted the Pharisees. They were still, in fact, Jesus had used the phrase that said, People are worse off once they come in contact with you than they were before they ever met you. And so last week we learned a number of lessons and the first challenge was this. If you haven't placed your faith in the good shepherd, the one who said that he would be the shepherd of your soul, then you need to trust him as your savior. For those who have already trusted him and maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've been hurt by the church, maybe even hurt by a pastor in a church, 
to be reminded that the good shepherd has not let you down. It is so easy, and I have been there, it is so easy to view a pastor as, as a perfect reflection of God. And you, well, you know me well enough. I didn't even hear that it was $29 to go to this comedy show. I am far from being a perfect reflection of the Father. Now, for any shepherd to not seek to be a reflection of the Father would be a dereliction of our duty, but we fail. And it's very easy to start looking at a, a pastor of any church and starting to think that, okay, they're going to always do what's right. They're never going to say anything that might hurt or anything that might, uh, might, might cause harm. And the reality is, is that sometimes, unfortunately, you have experienced at the hands of the church pain and you've been almost left out there to wander on your own. And, and we said, listen... If you've experienced that, don't put that on the good shepherd. He still wants to shepherd your soul. Also, don't abandon the local church. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I'll acknowledge that I've experienced hurt at the hand of the local church. And my guess is that if we would go from the front to the back, we would find, if you've had much experience with local churches, you would find that almost everyone has experienced at least a degree of hurt at the hands of the local church. That doesn't mean that God has forsaken using the local church. If God stopped using broken people, we would all be unusable. And so I say this, trust the Lord if you haven't, let him be your good shepherd. If he is your good shepherd, continue to look to him as the good shepherd Lord willing, the under-shepherd will be able to say, as Paul did, follow me as I follow Christ, but keep the right perspective. Don't give up on the good shepherd and don't give up on the local church. And then finally, the challenge to, to myself and to Pastor Kirk and to, to Michael as an elder, the challenge for us is that we need to see how God viewed those previous shepherds and make sure that he doesn't view us that way. We have to care for your spiritual well-being. And that means that we are going to preach and teach God's word in its right context. It's, it, it, it means that we're going to have conversations that are sometimes hard conversations. And there, I know that nobody looks forward to those hard conversations, but they are loving conversations as well. It's not loving to know that someone is about to, they're going down a river, let's say, in a canoe, and you know there's a waterfall coming up there. It's not loving to just say, ah, let them do what they want. No, you're about to go over the waterfall. What's loving is to say, listen, I see you're about to go over the waterfall. I don't want to see that happen to you. And be able to have those conversations. And so the challenge for us as under shepherds, under the Lord's care, is to make sure we appropriately take care of you. Lead and guide you. Don't leave you out there. If you start to wander away to do exactly what Jesus said he would do, he would leave the 99 and go after that one who had gone astray. And so when we do that, I know it's not always going to be pleasant. And you might even get mad at us for those types of things. But those are our responsibilities. So those, we, we had those three challenges last week. This week we pick up in John chapter 10. You might already be there. If you're not, turn with me to John chapter number 10. We're going to read verses 22 through 42. So an extended passage. Follow along as we read. I encourage you. I always like you to be able to understand and to think through a passage without me even needing to, to do that. But... But, but, but certainly the opportunity to learn is there. So as we're reading, start to think about uh, what are some key words that you're hearing? What is the flow? What is Jesus talking about as it relates to having just had this conversation about being the good shepherd? And what are some key places and things like that? So just follow along. Verse 22, then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. 
The miracles I do in my Father's name, they speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these miracles do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods, small g gods. If he called them gods, small g gods, to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place... Many believed in Jesus. I want to back up. We're just going to teach our way through this. The first thing that you should have seen as I began to read is that there was this feast called the Feast of Dedication. If you would do a little bit of research on the Feast of Dedication, you would find that this Feast of Dedication is what is these days commonly referred to as Hanukkah. Hanukkah. So I'm sure that all of you have heard of the celebration of Hanukkah. It's a celebration that lasts eight days. And I'll be honest, I, do, I am not an expert when it comes to Jewish uh, feasts and festivals. And so I had to do some research when it came to this feast of dedication. And I had to do a little bit of a history lesson. And I am not the greatest when it comes to world history either. But here's what I learned, and I'm not going to make you become a world history student this morning, but I love whenever, whenever we're able to see, because sometimes I, I think we kind of view the Bible as like all, oh, like these are just amazing things that happened, and like it's hard to almost realize that these things really happened in history. Like this isn't separate from everything else that was going on in the world, like these events really took place as empires were rising and empires were falling and you had this king doing this and you had this emperor doing this and we find that biblical history, well, I, I should more appropriately say world history falls inside of biblical history and so whenever those two match up really well and you can see them, it's kind of neat to spend a little bit of time there. So there was a Seleucid king named Antiochus Epiphanes uh, or Antiochus IV. He gave, him the name, he gave himself the name Epiphanes because he viewed himself as the illustrious one. Uh, I don't know if any of you have titles for yourself. Uh, we jokingly in our family, well, really with Kim and I, I always say that I'm the nice one. Um, Kim disputes that, and most of you would probably dispute that in a choice between the two of us. She's probably the nice, but I always call myself the nice one. I always call myself the responsible one. I always call my, so I have all these titles that, any of you have titles for yourself? One person, two, three, four that didn't raise his hand. Okay, wife pointed him out. Uh, all right, so we just have these jokes, but, but he wanted this as like his legit title, like I am the illustrious one. So Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV, he ruled from 175 to 164 B.C., so before Christ. 
and he was a ruthless ruler. During his reign within Judaism, and you almost see this break down a little bit in Acts chapter number 6. Acts chapter number 6 might be most recognizable for uh, what we see as the first deacons within the church. You'll remember that the uh, Hellenistic Jews or the Grecian Jews, uh, they had a dispute among the he- against the Hebraic Jews. And, and they, there was this dispute about who was getting more food and who was getting taken care of more. And so actually this division within Judaism between the Hellenistic Jews, which they were ones who, it's hard to even say Jews, but a Jew that is born isn't following Judaism, but he's still a Jew. And so there were these Hellenistic Jews who adopted pagan practices and idol worship. And then there were the Hebraic Jews, or you could just call them the regular Jews, is what I would call them. And they continued to follow the Jewish law. Well, Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV, he had taken the side of the Hellenistic pagan Jews. And what he did is he went into the temple, and he set up an idol to Zeus, and he sacrificed pigs on the altar. And this caused the Hebraic Jews to say, okay, enough is enough, and they rose up, and they were able to fight back and overthrow and and take control again. And so when they dedicated the temple, because... It had been desecrated, not dedicated. It had been desecrated by this idol to Zeus and by these, this sacrifice of pigs. If you understand that in the Jewish uh, religion, uh, you're not allowed to have pork, right? And so uh, pigs were a, a defiled animal. And so it wasn't an accident that he took in pigs as sacrifices. So when they rededicated the temple, they then had this celebration for it when they went in to rededicate it there was only enough oil to light the 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 the, um, the lampstand for one day it took uh, refined olive oil in order to be able to use in that lampstand and there was only enough for one day but that oil lasted for eight days so sometimes Hanukkah is called the festival of lights And it lasts for eight days, representing those eight days that that one bottle of pure olive oil lasted until they were able to get additional oil to put in the lampstand. So they viewed this as a miraculous work of God, and that's what Hanukkah is. So Jesus is there, and he's in the temple during this feast. And this feast of dedication, an eight-day feast, has to do with rededicating the temple. Rededicating the temple. Think about that. Making sure that we allow this to belong to God. Do you remember early in Jesus' ministry? What does he do? He goes in, and even though this temple has been rededicated, he has to cleanse it. Because they have been using it for purposes. No, they weren't sacrificing pigs on the altar. But they were still not using it for its proper purpose in worship of God. And so it's interesting. It's not an accident. I almost just didn't even teach through this part about the Feast of Dedication. I'm like, but, but it's so important to realize that Jesus is standing there. The Son of God. The one who is going to cause the, the veil of the temple to be torn To show that there is access between God and mankind, mankind and God. He's standing there and the Jews are disputing with him. And and, and so he's standing there in this rededicated temple during a festival designed to commemorate a return to worshiping the one true God. And the one true God is standing there and they're not worshiping him. Do you get the irony here? It's not an accident that John says, hey, here's the festival that's taking place. And then it says this. It says uh, in verse 24, the Jews gathered around him and they wanted to ask him this question. Now, this Greek word for gathered around him, it's used a few times in the New Testament. One of the times that it is used in the New Testament has to do with surrounding Jericho, encompassing Jericho. And the idea that we get here, and you can kind of picture this, right? 
there is a circle of people around Jesus. Not like, hey, let's have ourselves a little huddle here, but a threatening type of circle where they have gathered around him and they say to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, they didn't say this because they wanted him to say, I'm the Christ. And they're like, oh, well, cool. Like, great. I've been waiting to hear you say that. We want to believe in you. No, they wanted him to say, I am the Christ. Why? So that they could accuse him of blasphemy, so that they could take up stones and stone him, and they could go about their way. I trust that if you are asking the question in your own life that goes something like this, is Jesus really the Messiah? I pray that it's not a question of, I just want to ask this because I don't really care about the answer. I already have a predetermined idea in my mind. I, I believe that if you will seek him, you will find him when you seek him with all of your heart. Believe that. If you are looking for Jesus, I assure you, he's looking for you. There have been those who have sought to dispute the claims of Christianity. Those who have sought as atheists to just find the right proof, and so many of them have come to be followers of Christ after doing that research because Jesus is the Messiah. But they didn't want to know that. They say, tell us plainly if you are the Messiah, if you are the Christ. And Jesus answers them in verse 25. He says, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles that I do in my Father's name, they speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And so he has not only verbally told them, but he has also given them signs to confirm who he is. And they still did not believe. Ever had a conversation with someone about the Lord and they have a question and you're able to answer that question. But then it's another question and it's another question and, and there's really never enough for them. There's never enough. And that almost seems like what's happening here. It wasn't as if they didn't see these miraculous signs. Look in John chapter 20 just real quick. You're not too far from it. We understand why John wrote this gospel. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31 say this. John writing, and he says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these, they are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is saying, I did these miracles in your sight. There has been enough for you to believe. And I'll say this to every one of you. There is enough for you to believe. There is enough. If you are on the fence this morning between trusting in the Lord and not and living your own way, I encourage you to look into the word of God and the word of God is enough. It will show you who Jesus is. It will show you why we exist. It shows you how we got here, why we exist, and where we are going. Three big questions in life. God's word can handle those questions. And it does handle those questions if you will seek him. These Jews, they weren't wanting to know the answer, but Jesus tells them, listen, I did these things for you. If you would look back and just maybe go ahead and page in your Bible back to John chapter 1. And maybe they didn't hear this proclamation about him. Certainly John in his gospel writes this. He writes, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. There was no doubt as John wrote this gospel that he wanted everyone to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised one who, was, who had been promised to Israel. He's the one in, in whom you need to put your faith and put your trust. 
If you would go to chapter number 2 and you find the first miraculous sign where Jesus is at this wedding in, in Cana of Galilee and he turns the water into wine. A little bit later, you find in John chapter 3 that, that John himself had said, John the Baptist, by the way, not the Apostle John, to be different, differentiated there. But John the Baptist had said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, as we get to the end of John chapter number 10, uh, if you were following along when we were reading, you might have heard that Jesus crosses back over to where John had done his teaching. John the Baptist had done his teaching. And, and we find there that, that many ended up believing. And they said, even though John didn't do all these miraculous signs, everything he said about the Messiah was true. And you find in, in John 3 that, that he says, this is the Messiah. John chapter 4, we find Jesus healing uh, an official son and he doesn't even have to go to where this, this, this young boy is. He's just able to speak the word, and this boy is healed. John chapter number 5, he heals a man who had been lame for 38 years. And then he calls himself the Son of God and the Son of Man, the Messiah. John chapter number 6, you'll find the feeding of the 5,000. Then after the feeding of the 5,000, you find that Jesus walks on water out to where the disciples are in their boat. You'll find that as they cross, he has an opportunity to talk to the disciples, and he calls himself the bread of life. John chapter number 8, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, identifying himself not just with God, but as God, as eternal, the same as the Father. John chapter number 9, and we had gone through this a number of weeks ago and referenced it last week. He heals this man who was born blind. John chapter number 10, he reveals himself as the fulfillment of the one true shepherd for Israel. And yet they stand there and they say, tell us plainly if you are the Messiah. And beyond what has already been recorded by John, we know that many other things took place to point to him as the Messiah. So Jesus says rightly, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name, they also speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. I've told you, I've shown you, and you still do not believe. If you're here this morning and you're just waiting for that final piece of the puzzle, like, I just need everything to fit per... If you've just been doubting and you've been questioning, I encourage you to look to God's word and you'll find that final piece of the puzzle, that final piece of the puzzle, I assure you, is Jesus. He is the Messiah. He has said that he is the Messiah. But if you don't believe, I want you to hear what Jesus says about you. And this is important to hear. If you don't believe that he is the Messiah, Jesus says, you're not my sheep. I tell you what, everyone in here this morning, if you know nothing else when you leave this place, you should know that you are a child of God, that you are one of his sheep, that you belong to the family and to the flock of God. That is so important to know. You say, Pastor Dave, how do I know that? Well, God's word makes it very clear how you can know that you are a child of God. Do you believe that Jesus came in the flesh? Do you believe that he lived a sinless life and went to the cross as a payment for your sin? Do you believe that he died in your place, was buried, and then three days later rose again? Do you believe those things? And then not only do you believe them intellectually, have you then taken that final step of saying, okay, I want to trust in Jesus as my savior i need a rescuer i am lost without him i need him to be my rescuer my savior 
If you, haven't, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, you are not one of the sheep. Now, here's what is said about the sheep. And here's one of the ways to know whether or not you're a sheep, one of his sheep. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. Do you listen to the voice of Jesus in your life? He says, I know them, and they follow me. If you want to see a little bit about what it looks like to follow him, look at 1 John. Not the Gospel of John, but 1 John. Read 1 John and just kind of go through there and you'll learn more about what it looks like to follow him. He says in verses 28 and 29, he talks about the security that there is in being part of the flock of God. Verse 28, Jesus says, I give them, talking about his sheep. Those, are, those who are his followers, those who are a part of the flock of God. He says, I give them, what? Eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Says it like three different ways, doesn't he? I give them eternal life. That should be enough for you to know that if you are a child of God, you have eternal life. But then he says it using the negative, they shall never perish. So that's a good thing as well. Those who aren't children of God, those who aren't a part of the flock and the family of God, they will perish. They will be forever separated from God in a place called hell, Pastor Kurt preached about that just a few weeks ago. Then he says this, not only do I give them eternal life, not only will they never perish, but no one can snatch them out of my hand. So just in case you think like, oh, okay, well, maybe someone will come along and, you know, will use some like tricky words and convince them to go, you, I'm not going to lose any, he says. And then he goes on and he says, not only will I not lose any, just in case you're not sure about how this works, he says in verse 29, still Jesus speaking, my father who has given them, talking about the sheep who are his, my father who has given them to me, he is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. This is like quadruple eternal security, right? Like if you want to... If you want to wonder whether or not you are safe in the hands of God, whether or not you are safe as a child of God, look here and you get it four different ways. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one can pluck them out of my hand and no one will snatch them out of my father's hand. You're safe in the family of God. Now, here's the way that this used to work when I was growing up. Oh, but etern eternal security can't be a thing. Because if you're, if you're eternally secure, then you can just do whatever you want and still be a child of God. But as a child of God, what do you do? We'll just see what Jesus says. Jesus says, listen, my sheep listen to my voice. I know my sheep. And they follow me. If you find yourself hating the voice of the Lord in your life, you should very realistically ask whether or not you're a child of God. If you hate following the direction of God in your life, it is very realistic to ask yourself, am I a child of God? You would be wise to ask yourself those things. I, I don't know anyone who legitimately has given their lives to the Lord and then just says, okay, I realize he died in my place. I realize that he has reconciled me to the Father. And now I just want to go do whatever I want. I want to live in sin again. It's not that there's never times in our life where we lose focus, where we, where, where we forget sometimes how, how important and how privileged it is to be a child. of. It's not that we never have those times when we kind of wander our own way. But if it is just your heart's desire and the longing of your life to walk in a way that is contrary to the ways of the Lord, you, you should realistically ask yourself whether or not you are a child of God. That is not an unrealistic thing to ask yourself. 
Because again, these are the words of Jesus. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. And I know my sheep and they follow me. So don't, don't push away the doctrine of eternal security, which I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this morning. But don't push away the doctrine of, the, of eternal security because, the, well, what about this scenario? Or what if somebody did this? If you're a child of God, you are eternally secure in his hands. If you find yourself not wanting anything to do with the word of God or the will of God, you should ask yourself whether or not you actually are a child of God. We can kind of just boil it right down to that. Now know this, that if you are in one of those times of life where you have just kind of wandered your own way, remember back to the shepherd who desires to leave the 99 and come after and seek you out and bring you back in. It's not as if if you've ever gone your own way after you've trusted Christ as your Savior that you need to, oh no, am I? No, but if it is your heart's longing and desire and you just hate the word of God and the will of God, you need to ask yourself whether you're a child of God. Well, Jesus follows that up by saying just six words. I and the Father are one. And some people say, well, he didn't actually say that he was the Messiah right there. Well, look at the reaction of the Jews. Remember, they have surrounded him he's in the middle and it's a threatening atmosphere uh, whenever i think of that threatening atmosphere i don't know why i watched the karate kid a number of times growing up and you can kind of just picture daniel in that circle of the rest of them from what cobra kai right and uh and uh and you get that picture of like it's just a threatening atmosphere jesus is in the middle of that and he says they well they say tell us plainly if you're the messiah and then he says, I and the Father, we're one. And they pick up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, and I'm telling you, only, only God could, God in the flesh, only God in the flesh could have the composure that Jesus has. But it does remind me that we should have the same composure in the midst of adversity as well. He knew the will of God. He knew the plan of God. We might not know every detail of the plan of God in our lives, but we know every bit as well that we should be following his plan and that he does have a plan and a will for our lives. So when things get difficult, let's be like Jesus. He's in this circle and they're threatening him with stones. They have them picked up. Now, if you would go into the book of Acts, they end up stoning Stephen in a scenario similar to this. And yet Jesus says to them, um, I've shown you many miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Man. <clears throat> it wasn't, sorry guys, um, maybe I misspoke. No, he's every bit as bold and confident in what God has sent him to do. He says, I've shown you these miracles. Which one of those are you stoning me for? We're not stoning you for any of those. But for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Now, the thing that Jesus says next, i got to be honest, is at least mildly confusing upon first reading. Okay? What he says next, whenever they say, we're, we're going to stone you because you claim to be God, Jesus says, is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? Small g gods there. And if he called them gods, small g gods, to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. What about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Isn't that at least mildly confusing? Like when you just first read that? Well, you probably have something in your Bible, a little footnote that probably tells you to go back to Psalm chapter number 82. If you have a footnote in your Bible, or even if you don't, go back there anyway. Psalm chapter number 82. Jesus is quoting the Old Testament, and he's using a psalm here. Psalm chapter number 82. We're going to read the whole psalm together. Then I'm going to explain a few things and go back to John chapter 10. So Psalm 82, starting in verse number 1, we, we read this. God presides in the great assembly. 
He gives judgment among the gods. Now, we saw this small g gods in John chapter 10, didn't we? So we see the same general thing. I'll talk about the Hebrew word here in just a moment. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are small g gods. You are all sons of the Most High. Now, this is the exact spot that Jesus references in John chapter 10. But you will die like mere men. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God. Judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. This psalm is a psalm, uh, really a psalm of chastisement, almost similar to what we saw in Ezekiel 34 last week where God was pronouncing judgment upon the shepherds who were supposed to be taking care of the flock, but they were leaving them wandering. This is more of a judgment on human rulers. And these human rulers, they weren't fighting for justice. They were crooked and corrupt. I know that there are no human rulers these days who fall under crooked or corrupt. Uh, we live in a totally different time where all human rulers have the utmost integrity and uh, why is there so many chuckles that are taking place in our midst uh, no it seems to be a consistent thing throughout time right that when someone gets a measure of power they tend to abuse that power and so that's why we saw there why do you defend the unjust in verse two why do you show partiality to the wicked Instead, why don't you, verse 3, defend the cause of the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. But this term, small g gods, it's, the, it's, it's actually the same, one of the same words that is used for God. It's Elohim. Uh, Elohim in the Old Testament, it's the most commonly used Hebrew word referring to God. In fact, in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God, in the, in the beginning Elohim created the heaven and the earth. Okay, so Elohim typically refers to God, but it always carries with it the connotation of power and authority. So God had the power and authority to create, and he did create but unlike Yahweh, which is only ever used in reference to God Almighty, Elohim sometimes refers to authority given to human rulers as well. So whenever Jesus quotes in John 10 and says, don't you remember where it is written that you are all small g gods, that you have authority, that there are these authority structures in your life so to speak these authority figures in your life you are all small g gods what jesus is using as his argument is this listen even in your own law you talk about people those in authority as being small g gods having power and yet i come and i actually am the one sent from god I am sent with the utmost authority, the authority of God Almighty. So when I say that I am the Son of God, why do you have such a problem with that? I actually am the one who was sent with authority. You've been okay with all these other small e Elohims, small g gods, as authority structures in your life, and yet... You're going to resist the one who really is the Messiah. That's what his argument is. How many of you live under an authority structure just in life? If you don't raise your hand, you're a little foolish, right? We all live under an authority structure. I almost made a joke, but I'm not going to make a joke. We all live under an authority structure. Depending on what that authority, authority, some of you are in school, and you have teachers and principals above you. Some of you have jobs, and you have bosses above you. We all submit to 
government in some form or another, whether it be local government, whether it be county government, state government, or national government, we all realize we're living under an authority structure. The question that I have for you this morning is, are you submitting to the greatest authority in your life? That's what Jesus' argument is. Listen, you have been submitting to these other authorities, and yet when I say I'm the Son of God, I'm the Messiah, I'm the promised one of Israel, you have a problem with that. You're actually rejecting, and this is what Peter, in Acts chapter 2, he sets this up, and then Stephen, when he gets stoned, he sets up this same thing. You have rejected the promised one of Israel. So back to John 10, and we wrap up. He says, listen, you have, you have pushed me away. Verse 37, don't believe me unless I do what my father does. And we know that he perfectly did the will and the work of the father. But if I do it, even though you don't believe me, in other words, you don't believe what I say, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. And so again, they tried to seize him and he escaped their grasp. Then I already referenced this. Jesus goes back across the Jordan where John had been baptizing in the early days. We know that John is, has already been beheaded by this point, so John is not alive. Jesus stays there and many people came to him. And they said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He must increase, I must de decrease. He's the one. Let me ask you this. Is he the one in your life? Many, it says, believed in Jesus in that place, verse 42. We come together every Sunday not just to say that we... We did a religious thing. We come together every Sunday not just to say we opened up the Bible. We come together every Sunday so that we can look to the Word of God and we can allow the Word of God to speak and, and so that we can believe and we can follow. And so without exception, everyone in here submits to certain authority structures in your life whether it's a child to a parent, whether it's a, an employee to a boss, or whatever that structure might be, we all submit to an authority structure. Do you submit? Have you submitted? And are you submitting to the work and the will of God in your life? You say, yes, I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. Well, that's where it starts. And if you haven't trusted him, today's your day. You need to place your faith in him. But that's not the end of the journey. That's the beginning of the journey. We need to continue submitting on a daily basis, and I think I maybe even said it earlier, a moment-by-moment -moment basis. <laughs> because sometimes even as we wake up in, this in, in the morning and we say, okay, Lord, this is your day, we get a phone call. We run into a person. We do, and then just we, get, we go sideways. We go sideways so quickly. Somebody says something that sets us off. One of our kids does something that sets us off. Somebody, the boss, you know, he tells us to do something that sets us off. Somebody gives us a look that sets us off. They go slower than they should in the, in the speed zone, and that sets us off. And, and we get sideways very quickly. So that's why I say that we need to not only submit to him as our Lord and Savior, but we need to continue to daily submit to him as the Son of God, as the Messiah, as the greatest authority in our lives. Will you submit to him today? And then still in 20 minutes from now? <laughs> and then still tomorrow? And then still when any one of those things I mentioned, plus a whole slew of others I didn't mention happens, will you still submit to him then? Lord, thanks for the, the day. Thanks for your word. Thanks for the way that it challenges us, the way that it very clearly points to you as the authority in our lives. And I know for myself, there are times when I 
sometimes knowingly and sometimes just uh, almost without even thinking, try to reclaim authority in my life. I pray, Lord, for myself, and I pray for everyone here this morning that we would not only acknowledge you as the Messiah who saves us from our sin, as the one who accomplishes our redemption, but that we would also acknowledge you as the authority in our life who is able to, to say, you know what, that's, that's not an area you should get into. You know what, that's not a path you should take. You know what, your attitude's not very good right now, Dave. You know what, and whatever it might be that you are trying to do in us or through us, that we would submit to you. So Lord, I pray that you take your word, the one in which you have said, I have said I'm the Messiah. I have done these miraculous works to prove I'm the Messiah. If you're, if you're my sheep, I've got you. I'm the, I'm the one who is the Son of God who came with authority and am the authority in your life. So follow me. Continue to do my will in my work. And I pray, Lord, that that would be the desire of all of our hearts. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand, and we are going to sing a 